mountain formation. Here's a new word for probably some of you. It's the word orogeny, which means formation of mountains. We'll talk primarily about mountain formation rather than big pollutant terms. But it doesn't hurt to have your vocabulary expand a little bit because you read what it is. When were the mountains originally formed? There had to be some uplift of land for dry land to occur. There was the earth was covered with water. So when he said, let dry land appear on the third day, the land had to rise. And some was higher than others. And of course, that would be called mountains and hills. This was necessary. Uh, the land had to lift up the water to run off. The Bible does talk about high hills in Genesis 7:19, because it talks about the high hills and it talks about the mountains that were covered. How high they were, I don't know. It did not rain before that, but there were rivers. So it must have been from underground springs that they must have occurred. Now, the question is very logical to be asked. If the flood waters were 22 and a half feet above the highest mountains, where did that water go? If it's all already covered, how does it run off if it's already over the hills? The first answer I give is the earth is still flooded. 71% of the earth is covered with water. So the flood is still in existence. In fact, some ocean basins are as deep as 36,000 feet. If you had giant bulldozers right now, and you were able to smooth out the whole earth, you were able to push all the mountains level, fill up the ocean bases, the whole earth would be covered by approximately a mile and a half water, about 7,500 feet. There's that much water in the earth. So there is a lot of water here on this earth. I mentioned the ocean basins are deeper now than the highest continents or the highest mountains. The Mariana Trench is 36,000 feet deep. Do you know what the highest mountain is? Mount Everest? Anybody know about how high that is? Approximately 29,000 feet. So you're talking about the deepest ocean basin being deeper, over a mile deeper than the highest mountains. Plenty of place to catch all the water. Many people use this scripture in answer, where did the waters go? I'm reading it to you. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys. One translation reads it this way. The mountains go up. The valleys go down unto the place which thou hast founded for them. Thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they may turn not again to cover the earth. There were, yes, there were water covered. 22 cubits, I mean 15 cubits, 22 and a half feet. The waters were above the mountain. So what happened after the flood? These mountains rose, the valleys went down. And then I believe the water ran off. And that gives an explanation to things like Grand Canyon. That didn't take millions of years of the Colorado River meandering through, but it was huge rushing of water. As they lifted up, the water had to run off. Some of them probably formed dams, then the dams broke, and you have some tremendous geologic formations that you can see that the water carved out. This is the answer to the question. Are the present mountains higher than the mountains before the flood? I think without question the mountain ranges before the flood were much lower. The mountain ranges now are much higher. And God prepared a place for the receding waters by lowering the ocean levels, raising the mountains, or making the ones that existed into higher ones. Let's talk a little about mountain formation. I don't know about you, but I love to see mountains. A lot of mountains are caused by volcanic eruptions. And we're going to show you a series of mountains that geologists feel were formed by volcanoes. Because they erupt and then that lava melts down. Mount McKinley, beautiful mountain in Alaska. I think it is the highest peak in 
North America. Anybody know how high, how high it is? According to my notes, it's 20,320 feet. In the continental U.S., all the high mountains are nothing over about 14,500. Mount Rainier is 14,410. This is the crown jewel of Washington. Some of these mountains you've probably seen. Mount Hood, I had the privilege of living in Portland two years. I never ceased to, on a few clear days, to be impressed with Mount Hood. You can see it from Portland. You can see it's about 70 miles away in a clear day. There was another mountain that was even, to me, was more beautiful. I lived there from 74 to 76, but unfortunately, in 1980, Mount St. Helen blew its top. And it was, to me, was prettier than Mount Hood. We'll, we've got actually a chapter, chapter 24, where we're going to talk about Mount St. Helen. Mount Shasta is a beautiful mountain in Northern California. This is 14,162 feet. Mount Hood is actually only 11,209. All of these are felt to be volcanic mountains. The Matterhorn, on the other hand, in Switzerland, which is a famous mountain, is thought to be formed by a thrust fault. In other words, it wasn't a volcano, it was something under the earth that pushed it up. The energy to push that amount of rock up, geologists can't explain. And I can't think anything but just that God had to do it after the flood. That Mount Fuji probably also is a volcanic mountain. Here was the thing that baffled me. Have any of you taken physics and studied what's called angular momentum? Let's put it this way. Do any of you have grandparents or great-grandparents where they had a piano stool that was kind of like a circular thing that you spin? Did any of you, any of you ever see that? Did any of you ever a child ever have somebody spin you on the thing? You all know what I'm talking about? That's fun, isn't it? How do you slow down if somebody spins you? Well, put your feet up, but also you spread out, don't you? If you want to speed up, you tuck in. This is the principle that figure skaters use. If a figure skater is doing a real twirl, they'll tuck in like that. If they want to slow down, they spread out. A diver, to do a dive, well, like a two and a half gainer or three and a half gainer or whatever they, they do, they tuck and then when they want to slow down before they hit the water, they spread out, don't they? That the speed changes. You could slow down something as you spread your mass out. That's the law of angular momentum, which is, uh, has to do with the, the moment is the length times the mass from the center. Well, I get to thinking about this. I get to thinking about, well, what would happen if God caused these mountains to go higher? Wouldn't the earth have slowed down? And if the earth slows down significantly, then our days become longer, which would cause our days to be a whole lot hotter, and our nights would be a whole lot longer, which would our nights would be a whole lot cooler. So can you imagine, for example, Minnesota being 150 in a day and minus 150 at night or something like, you know, some condition like that. So that kind of puzzled me. Really, really, it bothered me from a standpoint of physics and, and my knowledge of science. I've got an answer to that. I think God carefully balanced the mountain building with the valley formation. In other words, he, he caused the mountains to raise enough, but the valleys to lower enough. And I tend to think that he kept the speed of the earth spinning about the same. Now there's a very interesting scripture in Isaiah 40, 12. It says about God, he measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and he weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in the balance. I just, in my imagination, I just pictured God just kind of with a scale. We're gonna raise a little higher. You know, that water's gonna raise a little lower. It says here, doesn't it? He measured the water in the hollows of his hand and weighed the mountains in scale and the hills of it. What an awesome, what a mighty God we serve.